For years, known as that little town you drive through on the way to Mount Hood, Wood Village is really coming into its own. Under the leadership of Mayor Scott Harden, along with the City Council and City Manager Greg Dirks, Wood Village is poised to become a destination rather than just part of the journey. From new construction to a city government that takes equity and inclusion issues from talk to action, you'll find a small town getting ready to move forward with serious planning and intention. With us today are Mayor Scott Harden and City Manager Greg Dirks. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Thanks for being here today. Mayor Harden, I want to start with you. The name Wood Village kind of evokes a, a cute little mountain getaway to me with, uh, you know, complete with elves and gnomes. But, uh, you know, in the past, it was more often just a stop on the way to Mount Hood. What kind of image do you want for Wood Village? What, what do you envision? Well, we often talk about putting the wood back in Wood Village. And, you know, when you look at uh, past large expansions, whether it be uh, Walmart or the town center, uh, you know, unfortunately, we sort of missed that vision. Uh, but I think we're spot on uh, with the design for the new byway apartments, uh, the design for a new city hall, uh, the potential design uh, for some upcoming apartments that will also be built on Halsey, uh, you know, where we have the large wood trusses and uh, large wood poles. Uh, some stone at the bottom of those poles. So it, it gives us that uh, rustic outdoor wood look uh, that uh, that matches up with our name and uh, matches up with the desire that our, our planning commission and our and our design review board and ultimately our council have for our city. I like I like that um, sort of a scheme. It's sort of natural and homey and, and comfortable. You know, it's, it's like a place you'd want to go. So um, th there's a lot going on. You, you mentioned that the work that's being done on the Halsey Corridor, that in itself was a, a partnership, wasn't it, with two other jurisdictions with uh, Troutdale and Fairview? Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Okay. And we feel like we've kind of taken the lead in how it will look with the you know amount of development that is already uh, planned and is underway. Uh, along Halsey Street inside of the Wood Village part of the corridor. And it's, uh, uh, and like facades uh, throughout the corridor are something that uh, all of the cities are thinking about then with distinct wayfinding or pieces of art that would let you know when you've gone from one city to the other. Nice, I like that. Greg, do you have any, um, any feelings on the, on the way it's coming along? Is it, yeah, is it a... I mean, everything's coming along exceptionally. Well, actually, I, I quite like your elves and gnomes uh, thing for Wood Village. <laughs> I've, I've never heard of that, but I, I like that. Uh, you know, we kind of call our style Northwest Cascadian, mm -hmm. um, you know, borrowing upon the basalts from the Columbia River Gorge, the wood elements. And we've really been able to, the last few years, really capture that in the work on Main Street and Halsey and really put it into a perspective that, you know, a couple of decades ago was was harder for those in leadership positions here to, to really visualize. And as as the mayor said, it wasn't for lack of wants uh, with some of the earlier developments in the early 2000s. There was always that passion there. And now that we've been able to articulate it, it it's coming across exceptionally well, as you can see from new developments. And with the Main Street's piece, you know, downtown Troutdale has this, you know, quaint, you know, cute turn of the century kind of Main Street look. We're getting our Northwest Cascadian look, you know, and, and Fairview's finding finding their their look and feel, which is kind of uh, that brick feel and um, you know taller building look. And so it's it's really neat seeing the three cities come together with each of their unique distinct feels, and yet we're all, we're all together on this corridor and get some really great synergy and some branding and advertising for our communities that are often overlooked for more of the more populated Portland uh, central places like Northwest 23rd or the Pearl District, for example, versus you know, we, we have a lot to offer here too, and not just for, for guests and tourists, but for residents as well. And I think they're starting to see that too. And, you know, our creation of more walkable communities and places you just, you just want to explore and feel good about. Yeah, I, I get the impression that this is not just to attract tourists, but that you want life to be better for your for your residents there. I, I think that's wonderful. Getting the larger sidewalks and and um, you know safety issues, I'm sure are are taken into consideration. Um, what, what's been the biggest challenge as far as working on this whole project? Either one of you. I'd say timing. Um, <laughs> yep. You know, time yeah. timing's been been interesting. It's taken some projects take longer than than you want just out of the necessity of, of partners, other uh, constraints and time restrictions. So we've 
we've luckily been been real fortunate with some development going on in the corridor that's gone in step with some of our efforts and work, like like the byway, for example. I mean, that goes back several years into its initial planning and development stage to where we see it now. Um, versus things like we're putting in four pedestrian activated rapid flashing beacon crosswalks on Halsey Street. Easy for and, you to say, huh? <laughs> and not really. <laughs> um, you know, and we're, we're that's a partnership with Multnomah County, who's been a wonderful partner in this too, since Halsey's a, a county road, and they've been amenable to some of these new and unique stylings and some advantageous uh, projects there. And so they're doing all the design work. We have funding for the construction. And it says, we, you know, we would have wanted to build a year ago, you know, and there's still you know, that last one still being designed um, that we just, we want to get it built today uh, because we, we see, we see the need today for these yeah. facilities, but the money's there, few more, few more design pieces and, and we'll get them built. Okay. I'm sure. just, mostly just timing. We want, we want stuff to happen yesterday, uh, but there, there's a process. You got to make sure that you're, you're, you're hitting all the right boxes when, when you're putting big packages like this together. Right, right. I know that um, COVID, I'm sure, set everything back some. I mean, that it had to have affected everything. Scott, how, how, did, how did that affect your planning for this? You know, it's, um, it's uh, similar to, to my work as well. I think that uh, um, while the, all of the construction for both of the projects that we've talked about, whether it be the byway or city hall, is uh, still on schedule, uh, it has taken uh, quite a bit, a lot of effort uh, by those purchasing teams uh, because, you know, COVID broke the supply chain and th things that you could, you know, readily go to uh, to Lowe's or Home Depot and pick up one of, uh, you know, was uh, uh, no longer available. And oftentimes they didn't know when it was going to be available again, if it was uh, if it was coming from either Europe or the Far East. And also lumber prices have gone up dramatically. And so we're really blessed to have, you know, have hired a forward thinking uh, construction uh, uh, manager, general contractor to do the city hall project in Kirby Nagel Hut because they had uh, made a lot of purchases uh, in anticipation of uh, having some of these problems. And that they had made a lot of purchases prior to dramatic price increases. Oh. And so we are, so we're, we are on time. And uh, it may be even slightly under budget right now, although it's, uh, it's probably bad luck to say that before the project's done. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm my biggest uh, uh, sense of when will it be done is, like Greg said, it's the anticipation. Once you see it underway and you realize that it's going to be built with the vision that you have, you just want it to be done, you know. And, uh, you know, July can't get here quick enough. That's when we anticipate moving into uh, – into New City Hall. Um, our second meeting in July uh, will likely be the first uh, meeting in that in that building. And, uh, you know, I, I just want, you know, this third Tuesday of July to get here as fast as it possibly can. I, I bet you do. Uh, tell me a little bit more about the, the City Hall. I know that it's uh, it's considerably bigger and uh, nicer than than the old City Hall as far as I'm sure it, it was fine in its time, but you'd outgrown it. And this this one is yep. is more of a municipal building, not just city hall, right? It's, it encompasses right. more yep. city hall and uh, and uh, and the community center, and so the uh, council chambers and the lobby are actually a, a, a great room uh, that will fit uh, uh, probably eight or ten eight to ten person round tables. There's also a, a 320 some square foot uh, a conference room named for. Uh, Longtime community volunteer Stanley and Rita Dirks uh, that will be uh, available for lease, uh, and then there's uh, another 192 square foot uh, conference room that's in the staff area uh, to hold uh, all staff meetings and that sort of thing. So significantly more uh, community room and more meeting room, uh, but there's you know there's lots of reasons to brag about it. Uh, not only is it going to be beautiful, but it's also built debt free. You know, with the technically just a tiny bit of debt, 1.6 million from uh, our urban renewal bond, our first bond issuance. But, uh, you know, the proceeds of the land sale and the money that we had saved to uh, uh, build a new uh, city hall is covering the bill for the most part. And so that's that's something that not a lot of cities can say that they could make that kind of uh, municipal infrastructure uh, change without borrowing money. I think that's and, impressive. Yeah. <laughs> Very impressive. And so yeah. and so, you know, it's. Uh, 
you know, and, and outside it will have, it will honor our veterans. Uh, it will honor the people that were uh, serving uh, on our council and commissions uh, uh, during the uh, building of the, of the new city hall. Uh, so, you know, there'll be a, a, a chance to really, you know, honor people that uh, uh, were involved in the process or have served our communities in other ways um, by protecting it, for instance. And, and so we're just, uh, we're incredibly excited. You know, even the dais uh, has uh, removable wings and it can fold in and could make a huge conference table. So, uh, you know, we're looking forward to, um, you know, instead of inviting people to give commentary or uh, testimony at a, at a council meeting and be behind a pedestal, uh, you know, they can just sit down at the table and, uh, and join the board potentially and uh, have a, have a discussion, you know, as opposed to a, a monologue and feel at home. And that's really what we want people to, to do when they're at city hall is feel at home. It's going to, it's, it's their house, it's their plaza, it's their splash pad. You know, it's a, uh, that's another reason to brag about it. It adds capacity to Donald L. Robertson park, uh, with the splash pad. Uh, we put uh, a conduit in the ground to run fiber, uh, and we are buying some smart benches so that, uh, the whole park will be a, a Wi-Fi hot zone that's free, and we're and we're looking at expanding that to other parts of the of the city. Uh, you know, between uh, basically between uh, Stanley Street and and uh, and uh, Sandy Boulevard, uh, all along the the Halsey corridor. Uh, but the the park is the first place that we will start, and so it's just a. Uh, um, you know, I, I, I can't wait to get in there because, you know, I'm telling everybody how great this is me. And I just uh, I just want to make sure that I'm right. It sounds like it will be a real gem for for East County. It really does. It sounds wonderful. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'd be proud of that. Um, Greg, is that is that a relation of yours? The, the uh, yeah, you know? yeah, a little, little bit. Yeah, my parents, uh, they, they were, you know, they were and slash still are longtime uh, volunteers when we moved in Wood Village. Gosh, early 90s. I don't remember the year off. And, you know, one of the first things they did was, you know, join my mom was on parks committee. My dad was on budget committee just, you know, to be involved in the community in which, which they live. And that's how you can help shape things and make sure it's a place you, you want to live and that your kids live. I don't think, I certainly didn't know more my future would take me as a kid, you know, uh, back then. But uh, certainly uh, love the way Wood Village is, is growing up. And, you know, to, to the mayor's point about uh, some city hall pieces, you know, one, it, what, we didn't sell the old land because we outgrew the building. Um, you know, it was, wasn't an optimal building. There was some uh, uniqueness that comes from a building that age that's been, you know, remodeled over, <laughs> over the many decades. But really, it was on five and a half acres of prime real estate in Wood Village. And that, that should be for a higher, better use. And that's what we're getting with the byway, 173 housing units and 10,000 square feet of commercial space. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. But since then, we had an opportunity to then create a new city hall. The council really took a community first focus with, with, with everything that it encompassed, including deciding to put it in the park where it wouldn't take any more land off the tax roll, where it can be an add to the park with things like the splash pad that had been on our master plan uh, for a decade and a half. Uh, that now, because we didn't have to buy new land, we could use that money to do some park improvements with the plaza splash pad. Uh, our free Wi-Fi is broadband speed. It's a 100 up and down. Um, so we're actually, you know, again, we don't ever want a, a kid to have to come to City Hall to do their homework. We prefer they could be at home and, you know, do their online schooling homework. But they don't have to sit outside, you know, in the rain in front of a Starbucks trying to get their Wi-Fi. They could come to a to a well-lit, you know, purpose-built place to to do some basic essentials. And that's that's what we hope, whether it's telehealth, online schooling, uh, whatever resources people need, that's why we're doing this. Certainly the pandemic taught us it's not about the availability of broadband. We, we're well served in this era of broadband services. It's the affordability part of that. And so we're, we're happy to partner to, to close those gaps, um, which, which is just a fantastic part of the building. And again, with that community first focus, you know, we, we call it the great room. Uh, Cause again, we want, we want people to hold their, their wedding anniversaries or just their weddings, their quinceañeras, family reunions. Um, that's, that's what we want the space to be. We don't want people to think City Hall is a place where they turn in their water bills. City Hall and, and the Civic Center is, just, is where the Wood Village living room is. And that's the last line actually on the dedication plaque out front. It says, welcome home. Um, 
because that that's just where we want people to feel like. I mean, we're we're a unique, special place, and we hope this building enables us to to do more for the people that call it home. I love I love that. I I love the um, the priority of putting community first. I think that's really really important, and I think it will eventually uh, encourage people to engage more with their government as well, you know, that's, because it won't be hope. intimidating. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think yeah. that's great. Yeah. And, and don't forget that part of that uh, new structure will be uh, the, a room for Metro East to be. <laughs> yes. taking your, Yeah. Taking not, your city not hall just meeting, a, your, a corner and a closet. It's meeting. actually a, it's actually a purpose built uh, area. Nice. Nice. <laughs> quite nice behind a hidden door. Actually. It's that's great. Of, that's great. Yeah. But it, you know, right. transparency in government is good and it sounds like you're just opening the doors and that's, really important i'm wondering about also when you're uh when you've been doing all this planning it sounds like you've really been holistic in your planning you know how is this going to affect that and how will that affect this and and that's really important but how do you make decisions as far as um who you hire and what kinds of uh, businesses you want in your area because i know scott you and your team have really kind of got a reputation now for being very progressive in ideas of equity and inclusion. And, and I, and I think that's great. I, you know, fully support that. And I think most people do, but I, but I know that you're, you've been using some of that, that lens to, to make some of those decisions, haven't you? Uh, we have uh, primarily to uh, sort of uh, shape how we function and make sure that we're including people. But for instance, uh, uh, while you can't necessarily put requirements into the contracting, we did put in a preference for uh for uh, minority uh, or woman-owned businesses among the subcontractors. Uh, we put in a priority for hiring local subcontractors. And I know that there was uh, there were was at least one Wood Village subcontractor, at least one Troutdale subcontractor, and subcontractors from Gresham. And so, you know, we do have, uh, we do have uh, local businesses that are uh, benefiting from that construction, and that was very important to us. Um, our DEI is primarily, though, a focus on better serving our citizens because really um, when you start to talk about institutional racism, you find that uh, uh, you're not necessarily, hopefully at least, not necessarily doing it on purpose, but it exists nonetheless. For instance, we just saw a presentation from REACH. It's a, a, a racial and equity uh, health uh, program at, uh, at Multnomah County on the county's crash data and how road design and active transportation design uh, has uh, the accidents are disproportionately people of color and the people that die as a result of those accidents are disproportionately people of color. And so I don't think that we might've ever dreamed that road design uh, could lead to some sort of institutional or systemic racism. But the statistics say it are. There it is, excuse me. And so uh, while we're looking at uh, Halsey Street, for instance, uh, the other thing that slows it down is just, you know, kind of getting the money to do things. And so we have a TGM grant coming for how to safely design the streetscape. And now we can make those safe designs with that, uh, that REACH study as a lens and make sure we aren't inadvertently creating a place that's, uh, you know, more dangerous for people of color uh, than it is for anyone else. It's interesting, uh, isn't it? Because there are so many things we haven't, we don't think about and because we haven't had to, because it hasn't necessarily affected us personally, but yeah. it does affect our community. That's right. And, you know, it's, uh, uh, for me personally, it's, it's started with the area, uh, uh, Black Lives Matter movement, you know, at least my, my, I never considered, would never considered myself to personally be a racist, uh, but I hadn't given a lot of thought to institutional racism uh, prior to the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and it can't be just a, a three word phrase and you say the phrase. So you're automatically an ally or an agent for change. You, you know, you have to go out and discover where the racism is and 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 put a halt to it you know when you when you know better you do better and and we feel the need to know better and so we have uh, gone through our uh, city's municipal code uh to uh scrub that of any uh, uh inadvertent racism uh we were actually happy to find uh that uh really what we're doing is modernizing things uh eliminating some duplicates and getting rid of gender specific pronouns 
but uh, and and there was a person of color, uh, uh, the assistant to the uh, city manager, uh, uh, Emily Wynn, that was uh, one of the people that helped put that uh, project together. And then uh, and so we've uh, we've done that work. Uh, we want uh, our uh, uh, communities of color to have ownership in their city. And so we hired a Hatfield fellow. Uh, we do almost every year to add staff capacity and to focus on specific projects. And one of those projects was how our mobile home uh, owners might become the owners of the land as well through co-ops. And so, you know, we now have a, a book that uh, uh, talks to them about uh, how to contact uh, CASA in this area and uh, how to, uh, you know, work with them and work with potential lenders uh, to maybe, you know, buy the land uh, that they, that they live on. Uh, you know, we've, uh, speaking of the land, you know, obviously we weren't the first ones to live here. Uh, that was uh, Native Americans. And so we have uh, worked with the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron to put together a land acknowledgement statement uh, that we uh, read at the beginning of each city council meeting. And it's also uh, uh, printed on the agendas for the meetings of our other boards as well, like planning commission or uh, parks commission. And so, uh, you know, we, uh, we want to uh, uh, remember the people that were the original stewards of the land and that, uh, and uh, honor the fact that uh, they didn't give it up by choice. They were forced and, and just, uh, you know, uh, thank them for, you know, basically, uh, you know, holding the place where we live, continually holding the place where we, we live close to their hearts. That's beautiful. So, that's, that's, that's a lot of work that you've been doing, a lot of work that some uh, jurisdictions, some organizations, some businesses, uh, people would never think to do. And that's, yeah. I, that's, I think, what I find most impressive, you really taking it seriously and not just giving a lip service. So, Greg, do you have anything you want to add about the, the work that, that's been done in the DEI field for what? Yeah, Village? and, you know, actually, Monica, you, Monica, you picked up a really intriguing uh, piece there when you talked about, you know, streetscape and how you've never had to think about that in terms of, of your life experiences. And that's how, you know, I tend to view DEI work. It's, you know, we all have our implicit biases, our implicit memories, our, our life you know, our shared experience in the lens that in which we view the world. And DEI is just adding more lenses that we can look at things through. When we look at a policy, a program, a, a thing, we can say, this makes sense to me and how I've, you know, lived my life or my shared experience with that life. If I, if I put these, you know, new lenses on from someone else, oh, wow, we, we should, you know, this, there's an obstacle here, a barrier for their effective participation. Let's, let's tweak this piece. And you put on another lens and go, oh, and now we need it. It's about this molding and shaping to do, uh, you know, the best work that, that we can. It's not necessarily disadvantageous to any group. It's all about just removing barriers because now we're, we're seeing a more holistic picture of what we're trying to do here. And in public service, I mean, that's, that's the only reason we exist is to serve the public. And sometimes it's also looking at, at you know, past experiences. I'm going to say urban renewal, for example, because we've, for Wood Village, when we created the agency just over a decade ago, said, you know, the board said, we will never forcibly condemn a property for redevelopment. If they're a willing seller, that's fine. You know, we, we will work with that. But we're not going to condemn properties for, you know, a big, shiny new something. Not all urban renewal agencies around the country are like that. And a lot of times they were, you know, they were used, I would like to say with good intentions, but had unintended consequences, a, you know, neighborhoods or, or parts of a city that had its own cultural designation or feel or vibe were, were wiped away. Um, you know, and, and our board and council is that, that that's not okay. You know, this, this should be for the people and creating things for the people that call Wood Village home, whether they've been here 10 years ago or, or will be here 10 years from now. And that's where doing things like the crosswalk project is something that benefits those who live here. And we also know it improves the marketability for, for an area for those that maybe want to wanting to sell. And then that's where you get to the other interesting intersection of you create a really cool place to live. And if you don't own that land, you're in trouble being relocated uh, through higher rents or not having your rent uh, lease term extended. And so that's where things like the co-op model we were really fascinated in because manufactured home parks tend to be a form of naturally occurring affordable housing. 
that should be preserved in, in, in our collective minds. Now, we, we can't be the bankroll for it, unfortunately. You know, we can't uh, necessarily help connect every single dot, but we can try to be the best conduit we can to connect people with all the right resources. Uh, we also know we serve a very low income area uh, within the Portland metro area. So we put together a comprehensive resource guide available in English, Spanish, and Russian. So people needing help and resources have a one-stop shop to go to and, and try to get some, some aid or help, whether it's mental health, 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 uh, financial well-being, uh, a lot of great tools and resources all available on our website. So uh, that's been exciting work. And then internally here, when you talk about like you know, hiring, you know, certainly as city manager, I want to hire the best people. Um, you know, I like to think that, okay, 50% of the people are average by definition of average. I want to elevate what average is and, you know, create, create the best team that we can. And this is something you did a couple of years ago, actually, is when someone applies to, to be on our team, we have someone scrub names and identifiers from the application before it goes to the review panel. So all we're looking at, you know, are the skills, knowledge, and abilities, not, um, you know, oh, this is, this is Sue. I used to know a Sue and I didn't like Sue. And all of a sudden now you're, you're, you're putting together, you know, a framework of this person that has no basis in, in who Sue really is. So you're, so you're scrubbing it so that you don't know the gender, you don't know the, the surname, you don't know that, you know, uh, any of that. We, we did that a couple of years ago. And since then, you know, essentially the past year with more stories coming out about the challenges from, uh, you know, women, minorities, people of color, one thing that just it, it it hurt to hear, but it was a it was a African American woman talking about her children and how she wanted to name her son, you know, a, a kind of a family name, but she knew that could impact his future ability to to get a quality job with with the spelling that she wanted to use. So she used a bit, very generic, I'll call it white Anglo Saxon, um, you know, type of spelling, and that that hurts. Uh, it, it really hurt that you know someone's name that's so personal. Um, that they have to do that. And so we, we just remove it from the process entirely. They're, they're a number to us until they come in for interview day. It's like, oh, so you're, you're 142. <laughs> I had no idea. Yeah, that, that's it's, good. It's, that's it's, much more yeah, equitable. It, it takes a little bit of time to do that, but not dramatically when you're talking about a recruitment process, trying to get the best candidates. And that's something any organization you know, can, can do. And another thing that luckily that the council enabled, because I think it's fantastic, is we have cert pay uh, for those that speak or write or understand languages other than English. So, for example, we have a couple Spanish uh, speaking people on our team, a Russian speaker on our team, a Vietnamese speaker, speaker on our team. So they actually council authorized cert pay for that. And so we partnered with a third party, essentially testing service that can, you know, verify the, the skill level. And if they need a third certain threshold, uh, they get that incentive pay because it's something that, that we feel valuable as an organization to serve our community. And so we should, we should uh, reward our team members that can have that skill or encourage other team members to get the skill that we'll actually pay for and then actually you know, give them the cert pay as well. Uh, I want you to know I'm taking notes here. <laughs> These are some really good ideas. They well, are, um, yeah, so. And, and, and in addition to that, you know, uh, so if both of our Spanish speakers are currently uh, working uh, with a guest at City Hall, for instance, uh, they uh, we also have hired an interpretation service that is on demand called Linguava, and we pay for the interpretation, and they do languages besides the languages that our staff speaks. I served on the uh, Reynolds School District's budget committee for Three Biennia, and you know between the the six years. There were somewhere between 40 and as many as 80 different languages spoken in the district. And so, uh, you know, what we have learned is we've tried to do better service, like Greg said, with our resource guide or doing Spanish language articles in our in our newsletter is that uh, Spanish is not enough, you know. And so uh, it's so uh, Linguava, you know, gives us the uh, uh, the ability to sort of interpret globally, I guess, for for lack of a. A better description you know there's there, there's not a language that uh, we might encounter in our city uh, that we won't be able to interpret now and that's it's impressive uh, yeah that's great yeah the the use of it's really cool so if we get a walk-in customer or a guest there there's actually a card at the front counter and it says you know what language do you speak 
but that is then phrased in all the languages available through Linguavo. So a person just has to point to, to which one uh, that they speak. So it makes it easy for, for the guest and it makes it really easy for us then to connect with that, that real time translation service. And we just used it a couple of weeks ago uh, for an Arabic speaking business owner. And it was, it was a fantastic experience. So the, to finally, con, you know, connect the dots and, you know, there are things we needed for, for, for compliance sake. He was trying to get across what he was trying to do in his vision for his business. And through that, we're able to get to a, a better place. That's, that's, that's great. That's wonderful. I mean, that's, that it makes for a much more welcoming um, place to be. I mean, you know, it, it, I have to wonder about that when people have something written that says, what language do you speak? But it's only in English. Yeah, <laughs> well, English. Yep, so yep. That, that was a really cool piece about Linguava. I was like, oh, yeah, we, we picked the right firm uh, yeah. for, for that. Yeah, good, uh, deal. No. good deal. Um, well, and, you know, and, and our, our population uh, since the 2000 census, the 2000 census uh, has doubled uh, roughly. And, you know, it's it's uh, uh, people of color uh, primarily. You know, uh, we're part of the Reynolds School District where uh, better than 40% of the students in the school district are Latino uh, and only 29% are white. And so the people uh, that are moving here, we welcome them and we want to be able to serve them, uh, but we can't best serve them if, uh, if we can't ask them questions, ask them what it is that they need and, and make it comfortable for them to, uh, to tell us, you know. And, you know, and, and, and as we've gone through this work, we realized we weren't asking enough questions or we weren't asking questions of the right people uh, in order to, uh, to best serve folks. I sat at a meeting not too long ago. I'm not, I'm not uh, disappointed in any decision that I've made in the, in the 10 years uh, that I've been on the Wood Village City Council. I'm just disappointed that I didn't ask enough people before I made the decision. You know, I wasn't doing the work to find out uh, how it was uh, impacting everybody. And what we've learned as a council is just because it seemed okay to us doesn't mean that it is. That's right. That's right. But the fact that you now know and you are now asking the right questions is, you know, that's a step in the right direction. Something we all need to do. I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but I do want to ask you um, quickly about what's coming up this summer for Wood Village. I, you have an annual event you usually have called Wood Village Night Out. Is that happening again this year? Yes, it is. I'm so happy to say it is. I mean, certainly last year, COVID really threw a wrench we were all kind of on reaction mode for so long that a lot of our community events, uh, we just didn't even know we're still res we were responding to that public health emergency, let alone trying to do these events, which brings the community together. We get a lot out of it because as people can come to us and uh, share some stories. They at least put some faces to names that they may see on the website. And so luckily last fall, we were able to do, you know, a drive through pumpkin fest uh, and then some other kind of drive-through event. So night out uh, this year is going to be a hybrid. So part drive-through event. So we have uh, a little swag bag of some some resources, some things for the kids. And we always like to put in uh, some uh, baking boxes. So, you know, baking kits for, for a cake or something, something family to go home, bake together, eat together, enjoy together. That was a huge hit at our Easter egg hunt. Uh, we had a yes, few things was. people could bake. <laughs> so we're like, well, let's, what's, what are some good summertime uh, baking things? So we'll have those bakes to hand out. Uh, from 6 to 8, uh, July 16th at the Woodlands Baptist Church, where we typically hold the in-person event. So it'll be a drive through component for them. But then we're also holding a, a virtual component like we did for our tree lighting with messages from community partners about their services or just a positive, uplifting or encouraging message from some of them, our partners, and then some musical performances from the local uh, schools, such as Mountain Community College. And I believe either Reynolds High School or Middle School will put together something because those kids have been working hard all year, too, with the teachers yeah. and trying to you know, put together something through Zoom and, and everything else. And we, we want to show off those talents that are in our community in a, just a positive, fun way. So it's it won't be the same as years past, but we're bringing it back. And then hopefully next year, bigger, better, and, and probably vastly different than the night out people seen before. It sounds like yep. a lot of fun. I, I'm going to let you go now. You gentlemen have given me uh, all sorts of good information. <laughs> and, um, I, and I'm just really pleased to, to see the direction that Wood Village is going. So thank you so much, uh, Mayor Scott and Greg. It's really thank been you. great to talk to you. And to all, all of our, my um, pleasure. thank you. Thank you. And to yep. all of our viewers out there um, from Metro East, please stay safe, stay healthy and check out Wood Village. <laughs>